on world history. Uh, one of our class members astutely came up before class and said, you talked about how Iran became hyper-urbanized and ran out of food when crisis hit, and I didn't get in my notes what the crisis was. I said, that's because I didn't say what the crisis was. And so now I have to tell you what the crisis was. Um, I had uh, explained that the great exuberance of Iran's culture, its urbanization, um, its uh, you know, phenomenal difference from what Iran had always been under the previous great Iranian dynasties because it was centered in Iran proper instead of uh, being centered in Iraq. Uh, and I ascribe this to a, to a cotton boom. It is, you know, perhaps unnecessary to say that uh, the cotton boom affected only a, a fairly small portion of the entire economy. I mean, basically, um, pre-modern countries put most of their effort into producing food. Uh, they uh, did not have the immense surpluses of modern times, They did, and their population was basically a rural population. So when you're looking at the cotton boom, you're not talking about uh, just endless fields of cotton, but rather um, uh, at, the, at the margin, but it was a margin that was very important because it stimulated manufacturing, it stimulated trade, um, it became emblematic of the, uh, uh, of the ethos associated with the new government. Uh, it is interesting that the, uh, the ceremonial garments that the caliphs had manufactured in special uh, factories that consisted of plain cotton or, pl or in Egypt plain linen with silk embroidery uh, had, a, uh, had an analog in the uh, area of uh, ceramics so that the most famous pottery style of Iran in the early Islamic period consisted of uh, plain white uh, you know, pottery with uh, an ornamental uh, writing in, uh, in Arabic script. And it was sort of a ceramic version of what these ceremonial garments were like. Because there really was, I believe, an effort to, uh, to create a new image and not simply uh, have a new government or a new uh, ruling elite. But, uh, but I think the, the notion of a new image permeated uh, Iran uh, as Islam grew. Uh, with the, the writing system of the Arabs perhaps being more important than their language in some respects because it was emblematic of what was, uh, uh, was new uh, in Iran. But as I say, there was a crisis. The crisis had a um, preambular moment from about 920 to 940. Uh, a rather interesting uh, moment because in 945 the caliphate in Baghdad loses its authority to a uh, uh, to Iranian uh, condottieri, you know, Iranian uh, bands that come in and take control of Baghdad and yet maintain their ruling centers in Iran. So Baghdad becomes secondary uh, to the, the new power center in, uh, in the western part of Iran. And these uh, the Iranian family, known as the Buyids, also known as the uh, Buwayids, because of peculiarities of the way it comes out in Arabic. Uh, they were from the mountains in northern Iran. They were quite unsophisticated. 
uh, but they were militarily strong. The caliphate had become militarily weak. So 945, you get this, this uh, transition. Now, as I say, this coincides with a moment in Iran in the preceding 20 years that is marked by exceptionally cold weather. As I say, this is a preambular moment. That is to say, uh, it got warm again after the nine, uh, after 940, 945, uh, and then it got cold around 1007 and remained uh, on average uh, surprisingly cold, particularly for the Iranians, um, uh, for about 125, 135 years. In other words, this is a significant climate event. Um, I believe that I'm the only person who has ever noticed this climate event. Uh, and now that I've written about it, I, when I walk in the street, I hear people talking about hardly anything else, but uh, <laughs> you know, so transformative has been my insight. But, uh, but there was no, it, it was kind of foolish of all my colleagues not to have commented on this a generation or two ago because we have uh, chronicles, particularly about the city of Baghdad, which is written about extensively uh, because so many historians uh, lived there uh, and uh, even if they lived in a later time, preserved the traditions of there. And when, now, now, you think of Baghdad. We know a lot about Baghdad because we've been bombing it for a long time. Um, one of the things that, that, you, that you know if you look at the history of Baghdad weather for the last two or three centuries is that it don't snow in Baghdad. You know, there was a, uh, there were some snow flurries last January. Uh, they melted more or less as they hit. It became a news story. Uh, but in the 920s, you would have a chronicle entry that would say on such and such a date in November, 20 inches of snow fell on Baghdad and stayed on the ground for three weeks. We don't have 20 inches of snow falling on New York and staying on the ground for three weeks in November. Uh, hmm? 920s. Uh, the number of, of extreme winter uh, events uh, between 9... 20 and 9.45 or so is, uh, is really exceptional. And then after 10.07, uh, you get another um, series. It's, it's not a, a complete series, but it, it's an intermittent series of spectacularly uh, cold weather. Now, of course, they didn't have thermometers. Thermometer hadn't been invented. But they knew that there were uh, dimensions of cold uh, and that um, some things were you know, more freezy than others. And they would know that because they would put down in the chronicle what liquids froze. So they'd say wine froze, or rose water froze, or uh, animal urine froze. And so you can go back, uh, uh, now we don't know what the um, alcohol content was or which, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You can't be very precise. But you know that it goes uh, well below freezing uh, in order to get these things to freeze. We have descriptions of uh, date palms uh, freezing, fig trees freezing, uh, nomads who don't go out to winter pastures because it's too cold, uh, you know. Um, the edges of the Tigris River freezing, uh, the canals at Baghdad freezing, uh, in Mosul, which is not all that far north of Baghdad, there is an instance cited in one of these chronicles of a man who took his class out and lectured on the ice in the middle of the Tigris River. So this, this is extraordinarily cold, a comparative uh, look at chronicles from 300 years later 
um, reveals virtually no freezing events. Uh, and before 920, there are virtually no freezing events. Um, this can, of course, simply be the, uh, the vagaries of uh, retention and uh, citing of instances, although there was one sort of control uh, for a later chronicle. It, it was possible to look at the frequency of, of uh, memorable floods because the Tigris and Euphrates flood memorably. The, the, the rate at which you had catastrophic floods remained a constant. Uh, it was the, and the cold is what became the, uh, the strong variable. Um, 20 years ago, I started collecting data on this, or rather I uh, forced graduate students to collect data on this. Uh, I remember a student doing a MA essay on climate in Baghdad and in a seminar I was co-teaching with a uh, eminent political scientist. Uh, he was asked by my co-teacher, uh, what was the consequence of this cold weather? And he said, I don't know. I'm not sure it had a consequence. She said, well, then why would anyone write about it? And I had to step in and say, because we're historians. And sometimes we just note things down because they happen instead of because they have a, a dependent variable or an independent variable or they fit into some theory or something. Nevertheless, in time, it became apparent that this did have um, significance. Um, but it depended upon finding more data. Now, there, were, there weren't going to be more data from the Chronicles. And so the data uh, emerged five or six years ago, I can't remember the exact year, in uh, the publication of uh, tree ring analyses from Western Mongolia. This was a project done by the uh, Lamont Doherty uh, you know, Earth Observatory, or whatever it's called, the branch of Columbia on the other side of the Hudson River. Uh, they uh, looked at tree rings from Western Mongolia and found that there was indeed a period of about 135 uh, cold years. There was a cold period that shows up in Western Mongolia. Now the significance of, of that, since Western Mongolia is a long way from Baghdad, uh, comes from uh, looking at the nature of weather patterns uh, in the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East is hot and dry in the summer. It, it, it has rains in the winter. Um, where do the rain, how do the rains come uh, uh, into the area? Uh, if this is the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, you have storm tracks that go in the winter from the Atlantic uh, across the Mediterranean Sea, and they drop rain here in Lebanon and Israel and Jordan. And then if there's a little bit left over, they drop it here on the Zagros Mountains between Iran and Iraq. And this is pretty much the rainfall. If you go south of here, uh, you still have winds coming from the west, but they're dry winds because they're coming off the Sahara. This is desert down here. This is Sahara. So uh, Arabia um, and southern Israel, um, lower Iraq, uh, southern Iran, they're very dry because the westerly winds don't bring any moisture. But the ones that come off the Mediterranean do bring moisture. Uh, these, uh, these storm tracks of the winter will vary. There are some periods when they're farther to the north. Uh, and then you get uh, bad winters in the North Sea, in Holland or Denmark or uh, British Isles, something like that. There is a, an approximately an 11-year an uh, oscillation uh, known as the North Atlantic Oscillation, so that you have um, the pressure gradients 
out here in the Atlantic, um, between the Azores and, say, Iceland, uh, that pressure gradient will change on this sort of regular, quasi-regular basis. And this is going to push the storm tracks north or push them south. So you have uh, periodic droughts in the Middle East that are actually fairly predictable. Uh, say a country like Syria uh, will go through a period of years when they have plenty of rain for growing grain, and then a period of years when they're, like right now, when they are suffering a severe drought. And the oscillation, you know, is used to predict that, you know, the rains will return once the oscillation uh, resolves in the other direction. Okay, that, that is, if you read general history books on the Middle East, or geography books, uh, they will say this is your, uh, your, your rainfall uh, pattern. Now, once you get to the north, oh, farther out here, let's say, uh, here's the Black Sea, here's the Caspian Sea, uh, and here's Central Asia. And here's Mongolia over here. What you have out out here, every winter, is uh, a big high pressure area. It's called the Siberian High. It's in Siberia or Western Mongolia or Eastern Kazakhstan. Um, you know, where the exact center is is not terribly important. Uh, around this, you have a broad circulation of air that uh, that brings cold weather across Central Asia. And Central Asia is indeed uh, very frigid. Uh, that cold air is running into these storm tracks from the Mediterranean. So in other words, um, these are low pressures, low pressure systems that are coming off the Mediterranean. But this is high pressure. And um, they don't really, uh, uh, penetrate here. So uh, you get uh, snowfall in high areas uh, in Iran and Turkey. Um, and it has to do with the, with the coming together of these, uh, of these systems. For some reason, the Siberian high seems to have become more intense. Uh, between, uh, say, 1000 and uh, 1135 or so. Uh, and that is a, a relative measure uh, by looking at the tree rings. It became uh, colder, and we don't know why it became colder. At least I don't know why it became colder. And as I say, nobody else has noticed it, and so I don't think anybody knows why it became colder. But it probably has something to do with, uh, with broad hemispheric uh, weather changes, because in exactly the same period, 950 to 1250, Europe becomes unusually warm. And this is called the medieval warm period, or the MWP. Uh, the medieval warm period has been noticed for a long time because this is when you had um, uh, a much more salubrious climate in Northern Europe. This is when the Vikings go to uh, Nova Scotia and go to Iceland uh, and so forth. Lots of studies have been done of, of how nice it was to have Europe warm. Uh, and it lasted for about 250, you know, 300 years. Then it was followed by something called the Little Ice Age, and Europe got cold again until uh, the 19th century when it began to warm up. Um, but the medieval warm period, since it's been studied uh, more than, uh, than the Middle Eastern cold period, people have noticed that it had certain consequences. It's a period during which you have a phenomenal increase in population in Europe. So that the population of Europe as a whole, between 1000 and say 1340, 
of the Black Death comes in 1348 and kills everybody, but let's say before the Black Death, 1000 to 1340, uh, the general population of Egypt appears to double, and the population of Northwestern Europe appears to triple. It's a period when agricultural production expands vastly to, a, to both accommodate and to a large degree produce this larger population. It is likely that uh, good weather uh, produced crop yields that generated a larger population. I mean, it's a fairly simple um, equation that may or may not be uh, easily defendable, but what it suggests is that if the population is going up in, e in, in Europe and you have at exactly the same time and I would suggest probably a related cold period in the northern Middle East, uh, then you're probably going to have a, a uh, reduction in population in the Middle East corresponding to a rise in population uh, in the Mediterranean. Not just Europe, actually, but this would also be Egypt and Syria, so Mediterranean, that's a, a Western phenomenon. Uh, this appears to, to have been the case. Uh, I would suggest that between 1000 and uh, 1200, you, you probably had a fairly substantial uh, demographic uh, shift in the northern uh, Middle East uh, as people either uh, died or migrated so that what had been the most exuberant urbanizing portion of the Islamic Caliphate uh, is hit by crisis. When you read the chronicles uh, that touch on this, they give you a lot of details about weather for, let us say, up until around 1040. After that, they don't say much about the weather, although you get hints from time to time, presumably because people have become accustomed to cold weather. And they um, no longer felt that it was so noteworthy that they had to, to write it down. Uh, but the, uh, the concomitants of cold weather, that is to say, poor crop yields, uh, yield, uh, you know, leading to famines and having epidemic diseases associated with the famines, uh, this became uh, a common theme in the chronicles as, say, after 1050, uh, dealing with the northern Middle East. So it's a period in which if you winkle out data weather, spe uh, weather data specifically, you can see the evidence of the chilling, but more abundantly, you see the indirect evidence of the chilling in the form of, uh, of uh, social disruption as groups compete for a dwindling uh, set of resources, uh, accompanied by uh, famines and, um, and epidemics, and leading to a, uh, to a fall in the population. Uh, this affects uh, Iran uh, from Isfahan northward, not southern Iran. Southern Iran is too far south to really be hit by the, um, uh, by the, by the Siberian high. It affects uh, Iraq from Baghdad nor northwards, uh, but does not affect um, the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it does not seem to have the same effect in Syria and Egypt, although there appear to be other uh, disruptive uh, climatic events there. And it seems to affect the eastern part of what we now call Turkey, uh, that is to say um, eastern Anatolia, which was largely populated by Armenians. Uh, it was part of the Byzantine Empire. And the 11th century is seen, 11th to 12th century is seen by Byzantine historians as a period of population decline uh, in the Byzantine Empire, although not in the Mediterranean portion of it. So in other words, the population on Cyprus or Crete 
may appear to grow, but the population in the east declines. And this is a period when, the, uh, when much of the political center of Armenia shifts from eastern Anatolia, the historical Armenia, to the Mediterranean coast at the sort of juncture between uh, uh, Syria and Turkey, which is called Little Armenia or Cilician Armenia. And I think that's because of uh, migration, that people left Armenia. It probably had a similar effect in Russia, but this is during the period, the final period of decline of, the, uh, of Kievan Russia, uh, and while we have occasional references to, uh, to famine and cold uh, in chronicles about Russia of that period, there, we really don't know much in detail about Russia at that time. Plus, Russia is always such a miserable place that uh, to have cold and famine and so forth isn't, isn't so memorable. So, it, but it, it, it particularly hits Iran and Iraq. Uh, now, cotton was, oddly enough, not that powerfully affected because cotton uh, depends on a long, hot summer. And you don't care very much about how cold it gets in the winter, because this is a winter phenomenon. So you could continue to produce cotton in Iran. It's just that as your food production is pressed, uh, there's more and more need to bring, to shift uh, production uh, to uh, food stuffs and away from, uh, from cotton. Uh, this was present, this pressure to produce food appears to be present before, um, be, already before 900. In, yeah. Does, does this mean that it was, there was an ec economic incentive to shift your crops from to, to food? Yes. Okay. And the economic percent, uh, incentive. It wasn't just, you know, we should, people are dying. We should well, no, the economic incentive shows up in the tax rates. In 800, we happen to have some, some uh, seemingly uh, genuine data from uh, tax registers between the year 800 and 900 in one local chronicle in Iran. In the year 800, the tax on, uh, let us say, an acre of cotton uh, was double the tax on an acre of wheat or barley. Um, the acre of wheat or barley was mostly unirrigated. It was from natural uh, you know, winter precipitation. So you add the, the tax plus the cost of maintaining the irrigation system, these underground canots, and you realize that the profit margin for cotton must have been huge if they could afford to, uh, to have it taxed at a double rate and, uh, and pay the cost of the irrigation. This is one of the indications of the boom character of the cotton industry. By the year 900, uh, the tax on cotton is the same as it was in 800, but the tax on wheat and barley has fallen by 80 to 90 percent. Uh, in some places, it was barely being taxed. And it, it seems uh, likely that the feeling that the cities were getting hard to supply led the government to reduce the tax on wheat and barley, on food grains, in order to try and maintain the food supply uh, of the country. Uh, this might seem precocious economically, that you would have a medieval government that would see the relationship between uh, sustaining the population and production in terms of tax incentives or discouragements. But uh, we also have an instance of this later on in Iran in the, uh, in the 19th century when, uh, when opium became such a uh, uh, phenomenally profitable crop that the government actually uh, ordered its farmers to plant uh, wheat and barley because 
they were running out of food. So governments are not, uh, just because they were medieval doesn't mean that they were totally obtuse. Uh, so there appears to be an effort to, to push the production into, the, um, uh, into food grains. And at the same time, cotton loses its cachet. The old brocaded silk uh, fabrics that had been characteristic of the pre-Islamic Sassanid era uh, return uh, in the 900s so that the elite of the Muslim state who in 800 or 850 had worn voluminous uh, cotton garments with cotton head covers uh, by the year, say, 1050, uh, they're wearing silk brocade. And the, the embroidery that had once shown up uh, on cotton to show it was a garment of special honor or distinction has shifted to be an armband uh, on the midst of the brocade. Um, so what you have is the return of silk. Everybody always liked silk. There's no, and, and the ban on silk had never applied to women. It had just been on men, because in the public arena, the women wouldn't be seen anyway. They'd be wearing some sort of all-encompassing uh, you know, dress cover. But for the men, um, the, the notion of an Islamic appearance uh, shifts, and the ruling elite shift back to this uh, silk brocade style. The only people who don't follow it are the mullahs. And to this day, they're the ones who wear plain white or plain black or plain brown and who, uh, who stick to the signature Islamic uh, visual uh, uh, you know, uh, image that you had back uh, starting in the late 700s and established in the 800s and 900s. So Iran uh, stops, it, it, we know from geographers that it was a huge producer of cotton, and then the cotton production largely stops. And when it finally restarts again, uh, say after, in the late 1200s, when the weather warms up, uh, the cotton growing is almost all in southern Iran rather than northern Iran, until fairly modern times when they brought cotton back to northern Iran and used it as a area for exporting cotton to Russia. And then that came to an end when the Russians conquered the Central Asian uh, Khanates and started growing their own cotton and turned countries like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan into mono-cultural um, mono, uh, uh, cotton-producing areas. Anyway, that's down the line. Uh, my point is that, that this, uh, this concatenation of uh, climate agriculture and demography uh, shifts the history of the Islamic world. What had been the center of, of the Muslim world, uh, Iraq and Iran, for, from, let us say, the Abbasid Revolution in 750, uh, you know, by 1100s, uh, Iraq and Iran are no longer uh, the uncontested center of the Muslim world. Uh, Iran, in particular, uh, in the 1100s, suffers um, loss of population. Uh, Baghdad, the great capital, becomes sort of a gutted out, um, half-deserted city by, uh, by the late 1100s. And eventually, in the, t in the early 1200s, the Mongols attack. Now, all of the decline of Iraq and Iran that is acknowledged by both Muslim and modern Western historians is ascribed to the Mongols. They came in and they destroyed everything. Uh, that is almost certainly untrue. Uh, it appears that the Mongols invaded a devastated land, a devastated and depopulated land uh, that had um, uh, become devastated for reasons that were not fully understood 
uh, at the time, having to do with the factors I've talked about. Uh, and so the, the, the onslaught of the Mongols appears all the more catastrophic because of um, factors that predated the, uh, the coming of the Mongols. In the same way that it's been argued that the onslaught of the Black Death in Europe was, uh, was exacerbated by uh, factors of um, uh, falling agricultural production uh, in comparison with consumption needs in the decades immediately preceding uh, the Black Death. Uh, this is something that is an awkwardness for, for many people. In other words, when you deal with climate change causing things or being uh, constructed as causing things, many, many readers of history and writers of history become very edgy because they think that people make history. They don't like to think about uh, impersonal forces uh, making history. So that, like, as we'll see uh, later on uh, in, in a later lecture, they love to talk about the Spaniards coming to the New World and creating a new European experience. They don't really like to talk about uh, the epidemics that bumped off most of the indigenous population. Because what's there to say? Everybody got measles and smallpox and they all died and the Spaniards took over uh, huge areas that were about to be emptied of people. Uh, and you know, how could you celebrate Columbus Day? Uh, now, some people would say, well, the, the Europeans deliberately caused these diseases. I don't think for the most part they did. Maybe Jeffrey Amherst did, but most people didn't. Um, it just happened. So ascribing huge impact to the Mongols um, makes, it, it's sort of like ascribing the huge impact to Columbus and the Spaniards in the New World. But it was other factors that, uh, that made it such a huge uh, historical um, uh, crisis. Uh, now, the consequences of this are things I want to, to go into a bit. Um, one of them I mentioned briefly uh, last time, and that is that uh, from, uh, let us say, 1150 onward, uh, most of the cultural production uh, of, the, uh, me, of the, the Middle Eastern Muslim world uh, comes from Syria and to a lesser degree from Egypt. Iran and Iraq drop out of the <coughs> equations. Although you often find that the scholars and thinkers who are working in Syria and Egypt are Iranians who have, you can see by their family names that they have migrated from, uh, from elsewhere. Also, uh, the Iranians migrate into what is now Turkey so that um, even though what is now Turkey, Anatolia, um, is, adjoins Syria and Iraq, which are Arabic-speaking areas, the second language uh, becomes Persian uh, after, you know, after Turkish uh, rather than Arabic. Uh, so you have a big shift toward the Mediterranean after the uh, uh, two to three centuries of great emphasis on Iran and Iraq. Uh, that's one impact. Another impact has to do with the coming of the Turks. Uh, from the 1030s onward, uh, down to the present day, or let us say down to oh, I don't know, 1925 or so. Uh, that, that's a good 900 years. The dominant political forces in the Middle East have been people who uh, have had Turkish as a mother tongue. Uh, it's one of the great moves in world history, the coming of Turkish speakers into positions of great uh, 
uh, political authority. Turks had been known in the Middle East in Islamic uh, political contexts since uh, the 830s, I would say for 200 years, Turks had been known because they were uh, purchased as slaves, as uh, boys in Central Asia, and brought to Baghdad or elsewhere, and trained to be professional military soldiers, and they were uh, known uh, by the term Mamluk, uh, literally meaning something that is owned, uh, and is often translated as a white slave or a military slave, or the more generic term uh, uh, Golam, which is uh, it, it's a, a Turkish youth, uh, often translated as a page, uh, as in a page boy, because of a curious phenomenon of Islamic studies, which prefers to use archaic English whenever possible um, because it exoticizes whatever is going on. But um, so these, these Turkish youth uh, would be, uh, you know, slaves and they might be soldiers or they might be courtiers or something of that sort. Um, so we know the Turks were there uh, before 830. The earliest mention of Turks under that word uh, comes from Chinese sources where they're called Tukyu, and those go back to the sixth century. So that, let us say in the 500s, uh, one or two centuries before, uh, before Islam, before any Arab armies get out there, we know that there were Turks living up here somewhere in Central Asia. They originate west of Mongolia in the Altai Mountains. Uh, supposedly that's the earliest homeland and we have some uh, archeological materials that seem to uh, perhaps fit into that early model. And they have moved across Central Asia, Inner Asia, in the way that nomads often do, if back and forth, not in, in a particular focused direction, but they're making use of the, of the grasslands and they are uh, nomadic herders. So from 500, let us say, so let's say from 550 until uh, 1000, something like that, they are there in Central Asia, north of where the Muslim state is located. And we have details about interactions between Muslim rulers and, and Turkish groups. And we know of individual Turks who are brought in as slaves, as I said, and trained as soldiers. What happens in the uh, 1020s and 30s uh, is that they come in as, tr as tribes or as large population elements uh, acting on their own volition rather than uh, being purchased and uh, put in training barracks. The coming of the Turks, in other words, is a uh, specific event that we can date. We have one chronicle uh, that talks about when the first Turks moved into Iran. Uh, and it happens in two episodes, uh, both uh, in the uh, first third of the uh, of the 11th century. The question is, why did they move? How can you be satisfied roaming around Central Asia for centuries and then suddenly decide to go to Iran? It's not as though Iran is that attractive. Uh, it's not full of grasslands. It's not great horse country. Iran is really dry, and the area they move into is sort of semi-desert. So why did they move south? If you read books on the earliest of the Turks, those authors who address the question will explain it. They will say uh, political and possibly population pressure and feuding led the Turks to move south. 
actually there's no evidence to either support or refute that. Uh, tribes in Central Asia presumably are always uh, in some sort of complicated political situation. Demographic pressure, who knows? You know, sometimes you have more people, sometimes you have less. It's, it's simply an effort to explain something that seemed to be inexplicable. All right, my explanation is that they moved south because the weather got bad. When I first thought of that, I thought, what a cool explanation. It gets cold and the Turks move south into, uh, into Iran, which is also cold. And I thought, why would they do that? They have horses. Horses are native to Central Asia. They've been freezing their tails off for you know, thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. They have sheep. Sheep grow wool. You know, they're, they're not going to be discomforted. Two hump camels, they're native to the area. Why in the world would the Turks have moved south simply became because it got cold? And the answer uh, appears to be that the particular groups of Turks who came into Iran, uh, known as the Oghuz, there are different spellings of this, various spellings of this. These Turks appear to have had a, com a com uh, combination in their economy between pastoral nomadism, living from the products of their animals in a more or less autarkic or subsistence fashion, and a cash economy where they produced something that they could sell or rent uh, for, uh, for some sort of um, material value. What could you produce in Central Asia that would be of that value? And how would it specifically affect the Ohuz Turks? And the answer to that is hybrid camels. Now, um, <laughs> all right. Here is your your normative one hump camel, uh, and of course, he has a cousin. The two-hump camel, who has a lot of hair, because the two-hump camel is adapted to cold weather. The one-hump camel is not. What's extraordinary about the one-hump camel, in uh, biological terms, is its uh, absolutely remarkable set of adaptations to torrid temperatures, um, including the number of humps, because the hump is simply a, a depository of fat. And when you are without food, and these both species of camels can go without food literally for months, they're simply consuming the fat that is stored up in their, in their hump or their humps. Uh, but the difference between storing fat in two humps and storing fat in one hump is the ratio between the volume of the hump and the surface area of the cone. If you have one large cone, you can have a lot of stuff in it, and the surface area is much less than the surface area if you have the same amount of stuff in two cones. And all of you who have forgotten your solid geometry from, you know, from sophomore year in high school or something, you'll have to brush up on this, but it's true. Uh, I know it because an Arab has now written about it in detail, stealing my stuff without any acknowledgement, because uh, I think I'm the first person who's ever actually written an explanation of why you have one hump instead of two. Uh, the reason for this is that one hump camels uh, survive in torrid weathers, in torrid weather, by having a temperature gradient of about 11 degrees Fahrenheit. In the morning, they're at 90 degrees, well, let's say, um, you know, 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the day goes along, they get hotter and hotter and hotter. They just absorb 
solar radiation, and when their temperature gets to uh, goes from 92 to 103 after 11 degrees Fahrenheit, they start to perspire. But during that entire period of temperature increase, they're perfectly healthy. Their appetite's fine, their activity's fine, you know, whereas humans go up two or three degrees and they're sick. The camels can go up 11 degrees, the one half camels, and remain healthy. As soon as they hit that upper level, then they start to perspire. But by that time, the sun's going down, getting a little breeze off the mesa, um, and it's getting cool again. So they don't lose a lot of heat by perspiration, or a lot of uh, water by perspiration, which is the normal way mammals will cool themselves. During the cool desert night, their temperature goes back to its basal level, and they heat up again the next day. Now, in order to maximize this, Camels uh, minimize the exposure, one of camels minimize their exposure to solar radiation. Uh, they're large animals, uh, but during the hottest part of the day, they will sit with their legs folded under them, so their legs are not exposed to the sun. When they are sitting, they will all face the same direction. They will either face the sun or face away from the sun so that the, um, uh, the, the, the profile that is exposed to solar radiation is minimal. They will not sit uh, sideways of the sun to expose their, their side. And uh, they will only have their single hump exposed. And as the hump diminishes because of consumption of the fat, uh, the, the skin is elastic and pulls it down flat. Now, two of camels, when they consume all of the fat in their humps, develop a condition that I call floppy hump. Uh, they're like two empty bags. Usually one flops to the left, one flops to the right. And it's just about as unattractive a, a feature of you know, camel pulchritude as you can imagine. Uh, you can have this really cool, sleek profile of up camel, or you can have old floppy hump in the next stall. Um, because the two hump camels are not ad adapted to cold weather, they're not adapted to hot weather. But it also means that the one hump camels cannot survive very far to the north. So that uh, the best, or at least the most extensive writer on camels, or rather on animals as a whole, in medieval Islam, uh, uh, an Arab named Jahith, actually of African origin, uh, says the reason the Arabs did not, in, did not move into Anatolia, into Byzantine Anatolia, uh, at the time of the conquest, is because their camels couldn't survive. It was too cold for the Syrian camels. So they would invade, they would have a conquest, they would raid someplace, but they never went in to stay. Uh, instead, they moved out to the east where their camels could survive in the, um, in the hot summers and make it through the cold winters in Iran. They had two large caravan, uh, two large garrison centers, one in northern Afghanistan, which is now the city of Mazar-e-Sharif, and the other in um, Turkmenistan, what is now the city of uh, Merv. And these had tens of thousands of Arab soldiers who had come, uh, who were sent by the governors and caliphs in Iraq and Syria, Arabia, to the east, and they brought with them tens of thousands of camels. This is how the one hump camel appeared in large numbers uh, east of Iraq. It was not an unknown animal. animal we have some images of one up camels that are pre-Islamic out in Central Asia. But they appear to be ceremonial animals. They appear to be rarities. Now you had lots and lots of one hump camels in these two specific areas. Both of these areas appear to have developed an industry of crossbreeding one and two hump camels. In northern Afghanistan, the crossbreeding was done by Arabs who became 
known as the richest Arabs in the East because of the profit from the trade. And in Turkmenistan, uh, the breeding was done by Turks, particularly in northern Turkmenistan, up between the northern part of the Caspian Sea and the Aral Sea. Turkmenistan is essentially, um, it's, here's, this is Iran, this is the southern border of Turkmenistan. There's the Caspian Sea is the uh, western border of Turkmenistan. The Oxus River that flows down from Mount Afghanistan is sort of the eastern border. Uh, you have the Aral Sea up here. And, uh, but most of the interior of Turkmenistan is a desert. It's known as the Karakum Desert, which means black sand in Turkish. Uh, the reason the Turks never moved south before was because they were in grasslands in Central Asia, and they would have to cross this, this big desert. They could send a raiding party across the desert, but to move the wife and the kids and the sheep and the horses and the camels south um, across the desert, big, big project. Of course, the way they did it, when they finally did, was that they went up the Oxus River until they got to Iran, then they went across here. And essentially, they relocated from the northern edge of the Karakum Desert to the southern edge of the Karakum Desert, uh, which has a temperature differential from north to south of about 12 degrees. So they moved to, to warmer weather. We know exactly where they settled because it's stated in the Chronicles. Also stated twice in the Chronicles that they settled as camel herders, not as horse herders. They, uh, they brought horses with them, but they're, they're known for for their camels. Now, what is, it to, what is the hybrid, the cross? You get a, an animal that looks like this. It has a long mound on the back that, ha that may or may not have an indentation, you know, four, five inches deep toward the front. The indication is that the, uh, uh, the the front hump is being suppressed genetically in the cross. It, and it is an animal that has what is known as hybrid vigor. That is to say, it is larger and stronger than either of its parents. Uh, it also is an animal that does not uh, produce uh, naturally reproducing herds. Uh, Unlike a mule, a cross between a horse and a donkey, it is fertile. It can have young. But if it breeds with either parent, not, I mean, not literally a parent, but if it breeds with either a one hump or two hump camel, uh, the next generation breeds back to the original. If, it, if, they, if they breed with one another, uh, the product is a, uh, is a runt that has no economic value and has a very low survival value. So this is an animal that only exists uh, like the mule if there's a market. It makes absolutely no sense to have uh, hybrid camels if you do not have some place to sell them or if you're not uh, using them yourself in some fashion. Typically what you had <coughs> would be a large herd of female one-hump camels and a small number of two-hump stud males. This industry has virtually disappeared. I do have some photographs of small herds that have been spotted in recent decades, but basically it's gone and is largely unknown. Now, the value of this for that particular area was that you had one, uh, one commercial use that stood out, and that was the Silk Road. The Silk Road uses camels for transportation. Uh, when the Silk Road first begins, let's say circa 300 BC, we find there are figurines of Silk Road camels 
found in the vicinity of Baghdad, now say in Iraq, that have uh, every indication that they are two humped camels. They are two humped camels. And originally the camels in the Silk Road were two humped animals that would be brought to Iraq. But by the, uh, in the Islamic period, the practice seems to have become that from Samarkand and Bukhara east, that is to say from this area uh, in Uzbekistan, from there east, you used two hump camels. And from here west, you used one hump camels, but in fact, you're using hybrid camels. So you have a transshipment point where all the goods that are coming from China are taken off and unloaded from the two hump camels and loaded back on the one, onto the one hump camels or the hybrids. And I think hybrids are the obvious choice here because they are stronger than the two hump camel. They're stronger than one hump camel. They are hardy enough to, uh, to do okay in winter, um, uh, but they also uh, can deal with the summer temperatures. Uh, they're sort of in the middle range in terms of uh, weather adaptability. Today in Iran, all the camels virtually have one hump. Um, in Turkmenistan, this area here, all of the camels have one hump. Once you get over here to uh, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, all the camels have two humps. In the pre-Islamic period, we know that the camels of Turkmenistan had two humps, not one hump, because they show up on coins and they show up in the regalia of kings in that area. So we know there's a big change in livestock. We know the only people who had those livestock were the Arabs. And um, we have this, these indications of a breeding industry. The breeding industry was conducted by Turks. They produced animals for the Silk Road. Um, and when the, the cold weather came, the female animals were dying and had to be moved south because this is by far the most northerly extension of the population of one hump camels. And this is the reason they moved. Uh, now, it, there are certain implications of this. Uh, if this theory is, is true, it's certainly the best theory around because all the other theories make, you know, have no evidence whatsoever. And I have, oh, a good three or four sentences of evidence. <laughs> um, but if this is true, then there are a couple of implications. Uh, one of them is that the Turks who came into the Middle East uh, in the 10 hundreds and form a state known as the Seljuks, which metastasizes westward and takes over pretty much the whole Middle East, either directly or uh, indirectly. Uh, these Turks, um, the Seljuk family, had many personal names that came from the Bible. Uh, so, the, you know, when they first appear, we have people who have names like Daoud for David, Mikhail for Michael, Isa for Jesus. Um, it was very clear that uh, uh, Suleiman for Solomon, it's very clear that they had had some association with a biblical naming tradition before they enter uh, Iran. There have been two theories. One is that they have some connection with the Turks who lived at the mouth of the Volga River north of the Caspian Sea who were are said to be Jews. It's a little hard to see how Jesus gets in there. Um, and that therefore their, their affinities are in this direction. The other possibility is that they had affinities in this direction where the Turks who were merchants on the Silk Road uh, were very often uh, Uyghurs, uh, the people who 
currently live in the northwest province of China, Xinjiang province. Uh, and the Uyghurs are known to have been Nestorian Christians for the most part. So it appears that the Seljuks were tied into the Silk Road commercially and tied into the culture of the Christian Nestorians uh, to some degree, although they became Muslims. Now, it's turned cold. Uh, the tribes have decided that they want to save their livestock. They ask permission of the Sultan to move into Iran and live on the, on the fringe of the desert in what today is the southern edge of Turkmenistan. The Sultan gives his permission and they move in. They prove to be a disruptive element. So a, a couple of decades later, another group asks similarly for permission to move in. The Sultan says, no, because your predecessors were disruptive. They say, well, we'll take care of that. We'll police our own ranks. We'll get rid of those nasty ogres who preceded us. And the Sultan says, no, uh, I will fight you. And they have a fight. And the Sultan loses. And then the gates are open for the Turks. So that in the 1030s, um, you no longer have a state that is opposed to the migration of Turks into the Middle East. <clears throat> and this is when the Seljuk dynasty originates. They are the first Turkic dynasty in Iran. And by 1050, they are in Baghdad. And taking over from the Buyids as controllers of the caliphate. <coughs> um, what they are not aware of, because nobody is really aware of it, was that uh, the economy of Iran and Iraq was dying. And that economy was based on agriculture um, with a special place for cotton, particularly for Iran. Uh, and the climate change was making it um, uh, bad for agriculture. Um, but the, the Seljuks didn't really, um, I'm not going to say they didn't care, but it wasn't their focus of attention. Their focus of attention was the Silk Road. That was what they knew about. That was what they were tied into. And when the silk brocades return in force under the Seljuks, and even a little bit before them, um, they're reflecting the trade uh, along the Silk Road, plus the growing uh, practice of cotton, of uh, silk uh, production along the lowlands of the Caspian Sea in Iran. Um, so they're, they're really oriented toward the Silk Road. You can see in the Seljuk period uh, uh, absolutely undeniable indications of Chinese art traditions entering, uh, entering the Middle East. Uh, Chinese um, uh, pottery designs. Uh, it's just a sea change in the culture of Iran and the Eastern Middle East uh, under the Seljuks as you get this sort of rebirth of interest in the Silk Road. Uh, one of the evidences for this comes in the area of coinage. Prior to the Seljuks, as I mentioned before, the coinage of the eastern part of the Muslim domains of the Middle East was silver the silver dirham. The silver dirham remains the dominant coinage throughout the pre-Seljuk period in, uh, in Iran and Iraq, even when they ran out of silver. So you had something called the silver famine, when people would uh, add other metals to the silver in order to make it go farther. So you've got silver with high quantities of lead or copper or Sometimes copper coins would simply say on them, this is a dirham, um, because that was the standard currency. Uh, the size and shape change a little bit, or the size, the, the diameter and thickness, 
Uh, but basically, this is a silver zone. Under the Seljuks, the silver disappears completely, and it becomes a great center for gold. So that under the Seljuks, the primary uh, coinage is the gold dinar, which up to that point had never played nearly so great a role in the eastern part of the, uh, of the caliphate. Now, the difference between these is that silver coins are great for facilitating uh, low and moderate level trade and manufacturers. You need uh, small currency. Um, gold is very difficult to use because it's so valuable. Um, but on the other hand, if your primary interest is in uh, Silk Road trade, where you're dealing with high value goods coming by caravan, or in, pay or in paying your army. Gold's great for paying the army because you don't need all that many coins um, in order to, to get the pay. But once your silver currency disappears, you no longer have the, uh, uh, the wherewithal to support a, uh, a lively trading and, uh, and manufacturing um, economy. So manufacturing continues, but it moves toward the luxury end. The consumers become the courts rather than the bourgeoisie. And one of the indications of this is that for the first time in Islamic history, artists start to sign their work. So we start to get uh, magnificent painted tiles where we know the name of the artist. Uh, same thing with pottery. Same thing with miniature painting. Because now the, the consumption pattern is moving toward the, the court of the sultan. Uh, and it's a luxury consumption pattern. And the, um, uh, the middle class that had benefited so enormously from the, uh, from the cotton boom uh, is now suffering and, and disappears. And the astonishing thing is that what this produces is the Tea Party. Uh, angry Iranian saying, I'm really fed up, I'm not going to take it anymore, you know, because the rich are getting richer and I'm getting screwed. No. It, it didn't ha happen exactly that way. But what did happen is that people left, uh, but they migrated. Later Islamic history is dominated by Egypt and Syria to such an extent that most people never think of what Iran once was. At one time, the, next to Baghdad, unquestionably the biggest and most important city of the Islamic world was Nishapur in Iran. Uh, not Cairo, not Damascus. But this shifts the whole notion of the balance between Arabs and Persians. Arabic speakers and Persian speakers. Uh, oddly enough, the Persian speakers flourish in Anatolia, where they migrate uh, under the auspices of the Seljuk Turkish rulers, and Turkish poetry becomes well known throughout Turkish area, uh, Persian poetry becomes well known in Turkish areas and well known in India, but the Arabs don't know anything about it. The, um, so it, it's a period of cultural shift. Now, when we design this chapter of the book, um, First of all, I didn't know I was, that I was going to, do, to learn this, this stuff. But even more, we were influenced by one of the great changes associated with the study of world history. And this is the redemption of the Mongols. For what? 800 years, the Mongols were the most destructive people uh, known. And you know the notion of um, of writing a history of the Mongols was a history of rapine and pillage and you know pyramids of skulls, mass murder. World historians love to say that the rule of the Mongols is parallel to the voyages of discovery of the Europeans. That is to say, the two great events, the, the, the maritime uh, adventure of the Europeans 
and the terrestrial adventure of the Mongols, they are the great uh, threshold between a long time ago and not so long ago. And so the Mongols become um, rejuvenated, uh, writing books in praise of, of the Mongol Empire as a, uh, as a flourishing business. I'm not saying this is wrong. I think in, in many ways that it's, that's a correct apprehension, but it's a huge, a huge change um, to, to redeem the Mongols. But when we were looking at this chapter, what it meant was, because it meant one of our writers really knew a lot about the Mongols, we decided we should stop the chapter in 1258, because that's when the Mongols destroyed Baghdad. From the point of view of the history of Islam, 1258 is, is right in the middle of crucial things. Um, and it creates the notion that the Mongols are a watershed Whereas, in fact, the watershed had come uh, a century or two earlier with the climate change, which the Mongols ended up being the beneficiaries of. But what they did in, uh, in the Middle East, for the most part, um, wasn't as important as other things that were happening within Islam uh, that um, fell outside the chronological limits of the chapter. But that means that I can talk about those things in a later lecture that deals with the Mongols uh, in the West. And um, this is all we have for today.